The next man that we're going to be listening to today uh, has a PhD in health psychology. He's going to bring every aspect of what you're learning this weekend all together from his years of research, writing his book, The Pattern of Health. Please welcome Dr. Fred Navarro. I just thought I'd stick that up there because they're going to look at it and say, why is that up there? What is that? It looks like I don't know. So uh, let's see. Q and A's at the end, and I'll have time for Q and A at the end. But I'll tell you that this thing right here is the symbol for something else, and it is measurable. It affects. It's something that all humans do, men and women. Um, it has long-term impacts on all kinds of health-related outcomes from beginning around the age of 18 to 26 up until people forget their names. And so my talk is about pattern of health. Every other talk pretty much in this conference has been about aspects of things, you know, diet, willpower, uh, physical performance, moderating using carbs to different performance issues, and they're all pieces of a bigger picture. What my studies have shown me over the last 25 years is that we have no control over how all those things interact within us. We can do separate issues. We can work out harder. We can eat better. We can try the best we can to, to improve our health. But the ultimate interaction of all those things goes beyond those just two, two, two or three aspects and go much deeper into a deep pattern that is invisible to us because there's too many parts to it. And I'll give you an example. This arrow. No. 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 Not moving. It should go forward. Should I go down? Sorry, wrong button. Okay, sorry, got it. Okay, that's good. That one. Okay, got it. He didn't show me that in advance, so I didn't get any kind of training before this. So here's a lady who's at this conference. I don't know her, but. Um, and I'm going to describe some of her patterns, her, her health attitudes. So in this case, she, in choices of eating, she prefers healthy alternatives. In this case, she's trying, she'd rather eat a thing of yogurt, blueberries, and health with little protein mixed in it versus fast food fries. So that's a health-related behavior, her response to a choice of what I'm going to eat. She also, there's also the choice of being sedentary, kicking back, watching the TV, listening to radio, whatever it is, versus going out and working out. And her choice is to be physically active. That's her response to that, this context of, am I going to be active or not? She also has a child. And whenever that child is ill or sick or anything, she hurts by something, her choice is to, I'm going to take you to the doctor and get this checked. Instead of, let me put a bandaid on it and go back outside and play, because I'm busy. I'm busy getting well or staying healthy. But that's her response to that context of her child being hurt or ill. But that does not extend her own health, her own, her own response to health or injury. In this case, if she gets ill or sick, she doesn't go to the doctor. She says, I'm going to stay away because I, I trust my body's ability to heal itself. So I'm just going to put a Band-Aid on it and go on or whatever I do and just maintain and never mind the doctor visit. Part of that motivation is tied to the child. She wants to make sure that she doesn't waste a visit 
a, a, her insurance, whatever it is, the money involved in going to the doctor for her child versus herself, she's going to waste it on herself. So part of her reasoning is that I trust my body's ability to heal, but also because I want to make sure that visit's available for my, ch for my child. And of course, she doesn't like to smoke. She doesn't smoke. Doesn't. So all of these different things are her response to a health-related situation. And this is just a small sampling of the variety of health-related situations we all experience on a daily basis and we start to respond to in habitual ways. Um, in studies of neuroscience have shown that we don't see things in our environment for between 30 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds, that are, but our brain detects them. So when we have habitual ways of responding, then our brain perceives something that we have a way of responding to typically. And so it triggers all these mechanisms in our brain and prepares ourselves to when we become conscious of it, to reach and grab the thing or to approach it or to retreat from it in advance of us seeing it. And that's really important because the more, uh, let me back up again. That is an adaptive response. It's a way of adapting to that environment and understanding its, its impact on us to either approach it because we like it or it's part of our goal set, or it's a goal set to retreat from it, stay away from it. So each one of those is a choice. But when you combine them all, there's a pattern there. And that pattern is dynamic. As a person moves through life and they encounter this and encounter that and encounter this, 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 a lot of it's unconscious because we can only retain so many stuff. And our brain has to deal with a lot of inputs all at the same time as we move through our daily life. And the big ones that we follow, that we're conscious of, we approach and then they become a habit and we stop responding to the ways we are unaware of. And that's what that is. It's a pattern of health. And again, that pattern of health is deep. It's just not a small number of things. It's a very large number of things, which is unconscious to us. Now, in this particular pattern of health, these people, let's see, at the very top, they retreat from active exercise, so they're pulling away. People with this pattern, they pull away from this pattern. They don't want to do active exercise. Good nutrition, ah, they go away from that. Get any kind of food they want, fast food, junk food, good food, sweet food, whatever. They're not really health information seekers. They react to illness whenever it happens. They don't proactively try to minimize it, proactively try to stay healthy, nothing. If I feel bad, then I'm going to deal with it. Otherwise, leave me alone. They have no commitment to fitness, no responsibility for family health. They kind of save money on health, and they avoid going to the doctor because they just don't care. Now, this pattern across the United States is found in 15 million adults. So the issue about these patterns is that they're, not uni they're somewhat unique to each person, but in major ways, a lot of people have this pattern. And part of the inability to make these people change and develop healthier habits is that the rest of their pattern is holding specific issues in place. So if you try to tell them, you need to get out there and work out, go exercise, come with me for a walk, go with me, and their response is like, no, I don't want to, because their whole pattern is, requires exercise to be avoided. That's the issue about that pattern. It's a whole. It's holistic. 
it's the entire person. And with the same idea that a house divided against itself cannot stand, a pattern that doesn't behave the way it's supposed to will not maintain itself. And that's the pattern that works for these people. And unless you address the pattern and understand all the intricacies of that piece and where it's high, where it's low, very, very difficult for them to change. Very difficult. Because anytime they try to, I'm going to try. I'm going to use my willpower and try. It's like a rubber band. You go on, try to move back, but it pulls them right back again because they're stuck. Oops, sorry. No, that was right. All these people have a lot of health risk factors. High rates of alcohol use. High rates of cigarette smoking. The most, these are the most people who just won't, aren't going to quit cigarettes. And the proportion of people in the United States who smoke cigarettes still, it's about that proportion of people. So the pattern explains who's refusing to give up extra smoking, who's going to keep doing it. They have high rates of suffering from migraine headaches, high rates of cl high cholesterol and liver disease and weight problems, back pain and depression. Matter of fact, these people have a lot of emotional stress disorders, bipolar disorder, a lot of mental health problems that are pretty severe that, is, that emerge from this pattern. So in my research over the last 25 years, I found that there are nine of these patterns throughout the United States. And each one, there some have similar behavior, some have are similar in a few areas, but then they're diverse. They, they go off in their own direction. And each one of these patterns accounts for a certain number of adults within the United States. And for those adults with each pattern, they have predictable health outcomes. So from my perspective, the long-term health comes of a person, the long-term health-related outcomes a person is going to experience in their lifetime is based on the path they're in or the path they're on. So I'm going to go through and tell you a little bit about each one of these at a very high level, um, but they're much deeper than what this is. Okay, the path one. This is the smallest one called critically discerning, I call them that. I won't tell you why I call them that, but I'll tell you that they have some levels of physical activity. They, um, some health interest in information, so they have good levels of health literacy, moderate levels of health literacy, but they're not really involved in wellness issues at all. They react to problems when they happen and they suffer from emotional stress, anxiety, sleeplessness. And I believe one that's blocked out there is that these people have high rate, higher than average rates of obesity. The second path, which is a type of which I didn't see in advance, is the health contented, health contented. That's path two. And these people are basically the 31 million people I showed you a minute ago. These adults are the ones that don't like exercise, aren't rea or don't like health information, don't want to think about their diet, don't want to be physically active, avoid going to the doctor, and they have the higher rates of smoking and alcohol use and depression and emotional stress and all the problems. But they don't care because they just live with them. The only time these people are going to go to the doctor is if their leg is broken, one eye is falling out of its socket, then they're going to think, I think I should go.
Path three, I call them the YZ frugal. This is the most cost-driven group of people. The cost of expensive things of healthcare is what really drives them. And if something is too much money, they're gonna just hold off. But, and there are, there's an economic tie to these people too because a large chunk of them lie in lower income groups. They're, but there's plenty of really rich ones too, but they still don't wanna spend their money on healthcare or anything related to health. So they're, they're active information seekers, but they don't seek information so much for the health aspect apart from that if I, if I look, do this, it'll save me some money or to look for low cost options. Um, but they're not exercisers, they're pretty sedentary. Um, and they also have emotional stress disorders, um, a lot of chronic allergies and respiratory related conditions. So the next three, Path four. Let me tell you, um, during my research, I've been able to do focus groups with these people and see them, see how they physically appear and they're physically different. This one in particular, I did a study of, of Medicare risk seniors um, when I was working for a health plan and we did two focus groups with each type, so we get to see them twice. And this is the group that had the most frail elderly. They were, we had to pay them the most to show up, not because they were resistant to coming, because they couldn't get there. They came in with, with the walkers and the hearing aid and they had pill packages in the sides of their stuff, so they had a lot of problems. They even complained about the, that the microphone over their head was ringing in the hearing aid. So they pretty much leave a sedentary lifestyle throughout. They don't really pay attention to diet too much. They don't look at health information so much. Um, they have higher rates of chronic diseases and heart risks. Um, they underutilize prescription medications. They go to a lot more hospital visits, um, but they don't take medications that they could take to alleviate problems. They just don't, they're, they're very, um, agreeable. If you talk to them, they would go, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. And you wonder, did you hear what I said? Because they just smile and they just agree with you. These people are also very driven by external level of control factors where they need help, somebody else to tell them what I should do. The family driven path five is the lady who is going to spend money on her family and her child's doctor visit versus her own. The family is very, very important to this population and they're not all women, they're about it's, it's very pretty close, 55%, 45% female to male. So even the males are family-centered. And they engage in moderate levels of exercise and have some kinds of levels of health literacy, literacy major, major focusing on the child, their family's health. This is the group that is the most changeable as people age. It's really driven by life stage. So as people might start out as the path two, they have a child and maybe they'll go into path five and be path five for a little while and then go back to path two. So that when the child gets sick later on, go out and play, put a band down and go out and play versus really get involved and be there with the child. Um, this group has the highest rates of postpartum depression. So when they have children, they have a report a lot of depression, but it's after the childbirth. Depending on where these people start, they're either going to have obesity after 
or not. So the, the, the pattern there, they, they came from, if they didn't start there, came from will have a big impact on their physical condition afterwards. The family driven group is a little bit older. They've already had kids. They're a little moderate in everything else, moderate in health information seeking, moderate nutrition, moderate um, physical activity, and their family is more a driver of their health versus um, their themselves. But at this stage, people start to increasingly use health care. Their demand for health care and their impact on the actual dollars spent on health care start going up. And they reach the apex with this next group, the healthcare driven group. Now these, the next three I'm gonna show you are the most proactive health and wellness folks that are out there. But their outcomes are dramatically different. In this case, this group, they're very involved in health information seeking. Very, very smart, very health literate. Very involved in good nutrition, really conscious of what they eat. They have moderate levels of physical activity, but it's not at the high exertion level. They're walking, they're gardening, they're doing low, low impact stuff, but, they're, but they report having physical activity, but it's not at really extreme levels. These people, though, have this issue of responding to health problems at the first sign they show up. There's in, in the literature that actually calls somatoform disorders, where people who think, I got a problem, and they go and they get a check, and there's nothing wrong with them, nothing wrong with them. But they then say, you know what, I still feel it, I still have the problem, so take me to a specialist. And they go to the specialist, and the specialist says, well, you could have this. Well, oh, okay, the doctor said I could have this. And so they start treating them, but there's still no problem. Sometimes these people have problems, but they have a lot of diagnosed conditions, which they may or may not have. But because of that, they have the highest medical cost of anybody out there, and it starts early. After the age of 30, these people are already driving up healthcare costs higher than any other group that I've shown you. But if you typed in the search words proactive health and wellness, on that list of things that showed up, a big chunk of them are targeting this group, this path seven. Path eight, path eight is an independently healthy path. This group here is the only one who naturally engages in vigorous physical activity. It's a natural part of who they are. They're gonna find ways to express it to get out there and use their body to exert themselves, to like the pump, the heart rate, the perspiration, they, they like all that stuff. They're also very good in nutrition, very good in um, watching what they eat, high levels of health literacy, understanding intricate knowledge of health and fitness issues. And they're the healthiest group you can be. I've, I've looked at the outcomes of these people in that focus group, senior group. These people came in in like tennis shorts. They still look good. And, and the, the males were scoping on the women that were there. So they were, you know, there was a lot of juice left in the independently healthy people. And in looking at their trends otherwise, the first time I saw a study with, among the Medicare population with this group and looked at medical claims rates, these people had the lowest. And it made me happy, because I'm an independently healthy type. And it was the first time I saw that well, if I stay this type, I'm, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to go into, head into the age range that I'm currently about to enter, and I'll be okay. It's super. So the last one is path nine is the naturalist pattern. These people here really like um, alternative health, alternative health care. 
and they're really good at nutrition, but again, poor on level of physical activity. Um, they have high levels of health literacy. One of the big things is, though, they, they're driven to alternative health because they don't like medical stuff. The other groups, okay, they, they don't have a big deal about doctors or don't trust them, but this group really doesn't trust them at all. Very skeptical of what they have to say. So they'd rather do something else and try to even expose themselves to that, that population, to that group. Unfortunately, they end up still using healthcare because the homeopathic remedies they use, the acupuncture they use, don't cure things like the heart disease, the cancer, breast cancer, their high rates of migraine disorders, um, all those same problems. And again, their proactive health and wellness also fits this group. Because if you type in proactive health and wellness, you're going to see a lot of alternative care providers, which these people go to use. Okay, so each one of these patterns that I found throughout the United States and other places in the UK and in China, the exact same patterns. Oops, sorry. Within each person, they form what I call your path identity. Because people express each of these patterns to different degrees, it's possible for a person to be, have the influence of more than one path, where they can be 70% one and 30% of another. Very, it's very rare that people are three, show strong influence of three, but there can be two. But this pattern shapes the way you respond to issues. So it's deep, it's a deep pattern. All of your health-related goals, your habits, your, the things you're seeking are wrapped up in this pattern. They're all tied in together in a unique kind of form. If, you, if, I, if I know a person's path, what their path is, I can predict what areas of health they're going to approach and what areas of health they're going to avoid, whether they're going to be Active, active nutrition information seekers or active physical activity, or they're going to go to the doctor a lot, or going to care for the child's health, or they're going to be health literate, all kinds of factors by knowing what their path is. And it unconsciously, it has its, the pattern has its own impact on health, separate and unique from all the behaviors that make it up. And that's why I was, uh, we can do all we can do to be healthy and fit and stay, you know, and because uh, looking at a lot of you, I can tell kind of what your types probably are for a majority of you. But it's something, because we don't know about it, we're a slave to it. We really don't know what it is. We don't know where it begins, where it ends, what, what the exact parameters are parameters of it are, so we were powerless to make any change with it. We're powerless to make it do, alter how it's impacting us. Because this is over your lifetime. Um, people do change their path, what patterns they're in, but for the majority of people, probably 80% of the people who start in a given path are going to stay in that path. There's 20% who will naturally move from one to the other as different aspects of their life might change. But for, them, for most of them, they're stuck. Unless you're in the path eight pattern where it's a good place to be stuck. And again, each one of these, you can kind of organize them by how they're involved in health. So over here, you have the low involvement people the critically discerning, health contented, wisely frugal, moderate level of involvement, traditionalist, family centered, family driven, and the really high involvement people, which probably most of the people who are here fall in one of these top three healthcare driven, independently healthy, and naturalist. And again, this looks at rates of nutrition. New health and vigorous physical activity is why you can see that only the independently healthy pattern 
is really out there, really working out hard. No one else does it to that extreme, although there, there is a lot of the focus on the nutritional side of things, so they have um, some of it. These are the, rate, the odds of having depression to based on your pattern. Like I said before, that um, higher rates of depression for the health contented, postpartum depression for the family centered. Um, the people with no pattern, there's about 10% of the population has no pattern. Um, but that gets smaller as people get older. So as you, as you age, in a way this is kind of a developmental phenomena, so that it's mainly an adult thing that happens. And as people get older, the number of people without a pattern shrinks smaller and smaller and smaller. So the independently healthy pattern, path eight, is the only one that's the most protective against depression. Same is true of obesity. Um, the odds of obesity are really impacted by the path you have, the path you're in and how hard it's gonna be for you to get rid of that if you suffer from that problem. Again, why the independently healthy pattern, the path eight is so positive in terms of long-term health impacts is because it's the most protective of problems like that. And this pattern is just true with heart disease, high cholesterol, cancer, um, any kind of disease you can name except for skin cancer. The independently healthy have a higher rate of suffering from skin cancer. Why? Yeah, they're outside working out. <laughs> they don't put the sunscreen on. They don't put the stuff on. They just go for it. Okay, so they said the major problem that these patterns present right now is that they're hidden. They're hidden in your everyday actions that you perform. And because people have no awareness of them, of their impact on long-term health outcomes, people are a slave to them. They do not know that they're there at all. In, in a way, I'm not gonna try to raise my Thing, but it is similar to what Louis Pasteur went through when he found out, you know, he really worked with beer. He was working on stuff to ferment beer. That was his major focus on the small fermentation process and discovery of germs. Uh, but we started to realize it, it, it had roles in infection. And so something unseen and tiny had big impacts on health it wasn't for 30 years after Louis Pasteur published his first paper that some doctor said, I'm gonna try it and see what happens with his surgery where he washed his hands. He told everybody else, wash your hands, disinfect yourself, and all of a sudden, better improvement, lower rates of infection all over the place. That's where it began 30 years after. But it's the idea that something you can't see and feel or taste, anything like that can have an impact on your health. This is the same. And, but there is one optimal pattern, the best one you can have. But right now, no one is able to purposefully move there. Because one, they don't know where they're starting, and two, they don't know how to change what to change, and what can they change, what don't they have to change? It's a complete mystery. So here's my pitch. So my solution is what I call a path personal analysis. And the purpose of this analysis too is to help a person find out what their dominant path is to really do a deep probe of the traits of the, how they express currently and how it fits and how it's shaped by each one of these paths. Now, path-person analysis involves two sessions. 
The first session is the assessment and a deep probing. And that takes a good hour. I take all that input and, and over the course of a week or so, I do the analysis, find out what that person's dominant path is. Exactly, shouldn't exactly how they fit the path, where they are, how strong that path in a sense is pulling them. And then explore their current health issues as well as their long-term health prospects based on the path that they have right now. The second part of the path process analysis is to show them what I call a path change map, which says, here's where you are right now. And here are the behaviors that you're out of alignment on with path eight. Now, I didn't plan ahead of time that path eight would be the best pattern. I didn't know at all. This has only come after 25 years of study and looking at study after study after study and looking at claims rates and disease rates and all these kinds of factors to see that, wow, this path A really does perform the best. So there is an optimal one, but um, it's not because I planned it. So with this path process analysis, then it helps you get a, a map. And if for those who want to, there's some path coaching that goes along with that. It's short because a lot of the responsibility for a person in changing their path is their own. It's gonna involve them figuring out why did I adopt that initial behavior? Think of it in terms of the context, the entire pattern they have, and then slowly work to change them, recognizing that the pattern's going to hold them. So there's gonna be a lot of resistance depending on how strongly their dominant path is pulling them, in a sense. There are some people like with the path two pattern, very hard to change because for some reason that path pulls people very, very strongly. When you look at everybody around, in a sense, you could draw little circles around each path and say, here's 90%, here's 80%, 60%, 50%. Um, the path five pattern, for example, the family-centered pattern, everybody's spread all around that. There's many people who are 10% of the way as 90% of the way. They're all spread out. That's why they can change, they can come in and out. But path two, very tight, pulls them very strongly. The 70% of the people in path eight are 70% of the way to that pattern means they're stuck, they're gonna be very, that's why current efforts to change smoking habits have stopped. There's, they've kind of hit a roadblock because they've hit path two. They've weeded out all everybody else and there's still path two left, very tough to change them. Okay, and in the change map, what I show you is exactly, sometimes you don't have to change much of anything. There's only a few, mo for example, path seven, the one that drives healthier costs the most, which has the highest rates of diagnosed diseases, they only differ from path eight on two behaviors. But those two behaviors make a world of difference, dramatic difference. So path seven people, and to some extent path nine people, don't have a lot to change. What they do have to change is gonna be hard because both things they want to have to change are very strong within them. Okay, so I'm at the point now where it's not quite 40 minutes, but I can start taking questions, I'll tell you. The book I have out now is called Pattern of Health. It can be found at patternofhealth.com. Um, it's by, I'm with the Body IO group with uh, Kiefer, John Kiefer, great guy. 
Um, so I think I'm ready for any questions if anybody has any. I actually have three questions. Oh, good. Okay. One, um, I'm a health coach, and a lot of the people that I work with are very exercise phobic and don't want to get out there. And I'm like, that's okay. We'll just get you walking. We'll get you moving. We'll get you sitting less. But my big aha seeing your charts is that the one thing that the fact that the half eight people have is vigorous exercise. So that's really the key. To, the end result is to get people to that point of some kind of vigorous ex exercise at least once a week. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Here's my second question. Big wow, seeing the family-centered and the family-driven flipping in opposite directions for obesity and depression, why? I, I well. Those seem like close groups, and the, to see those two things polar opposites. You know what the, what's funny, though, is that they're, part of the family-driven group is difficult because they're so moderate on everything. They don't have a strong opinion in a lot of areas. But one thing they do have in common with a family center group is, is high rates of demand for dependent claims. They have higher the, how do I say this? You look at medical claims, they both have the highest rate of dependent claims. They both have a lot of claims for children. And, but the family center group likes the being involved in family health as part of their identity. They really just want to do it. And family driven, or they don't have that as high level, but they still have the, the dependent care claims. So their family centered people are family centered. Family driven are, you know, they're pushed to it. So it's like a cart horse kind of thing. With yes. The two. Okay. It, look, this is what it looks like. Um, but the, and again, family-driven people are older, so they, they don't have higher, they're generally not recovering from things like postpartum issues. They, they, they're years from that. Um, they can have obesity, just it is not a thing that stands out with that pattern, you know, as a, as a dominant risk factor. Yeah. I know that you do this amazing assessment with people. Do you have an online version of that assessment or is it in your book where like you can kind of give people a quiz and get a rough estimate of what path they're on? In the book, there, there is a, a set of questions which are similar to the path questions where people go through them and answer them and then look at the end of the book, there's a listing and description of all nine patterns as well as the risk factors for each one. A person can get a pretty good, 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 pretty good feel for what path they're in. In groups of people, I found that a person's usually 80% correct at identifying the path that they have. Hello. Hello. Um, psychotherapist, so my question to you, and we've talked about this a little bit before, but I think it might be interesting for others. How much are these patterns innate? or are we born with, like a personality, and how much are learned, or the combination, in order to say, well, if I'm in one pattern, after doing your assessment, I wanna to change to another pattern, is that something that's adaptive based on innate traits, or learned, or a combination? I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a combination. In terms of the innate issue versus the, I guess, the nature versus nurture, it's a combination of both. Um, these are called patterns of adapting to health because it's a person's adaptation, their response to different health-related issues. So it, it involves a context, it involves an experience of something. And um, some people don't settle into their, in their dominant path until after the age of 26. So it's not innate. It, people can adopt it. Uh, some people show their pattern early um, versus other people. They could they actually be the no pattern group for a long time, but then all of a sudden they now have a dominant path. So um, part of the theory that explains the, the, the why the path exists at all the best is complex systems theory. It's not really a personality trait. It's a behavior of 
a big population responding to a similar environment, all interacting together that naturally forms patterns. I think that's the best explanation of what path are. Hi. Here. Front row. Front row. Oh, hi. What's the main difference between the 80% that can't change and the 20% that you said they, can, they change? What do you say the main difference? Um, the major difference is how close they are to the path. It's kind of like the, um, it's not the same, but the analogy is the same. <laughs> that the closer a planet is to a, a star, the more energy it's going to take to move it from that orbit because it's close. It's moving around very, very fast, dynamic. You have to stop it and slow it down, whatever it's going to take to make it change the orbit, I'll say. Um, the, the path patterns are not quite the same as that, but they're, they're the patterns that work for that system of many interacting parts. Um, as I said, all the things that are addressed in this conference they're all pieces of a larger puzzle. And where we can try to control how much we do of each one of those things, we can control. We can't control how they interact within us. We don't know what pattern they're going to adopt, what pattern they're going to settle into. And what complex systems theory shows is that they do and they have to. That's the way the system works. Um, but the patterns people form are, occur naturally. And the closer a particle is to that pattern, the more it's going to have to go through a dynamic process of complete reorganization before it will settle into, into a different one. So people who are closer to a pattern, they're going to require a lot more resistance and dynamic change to move that sucker out to, to a different pattern. So in, in, a, in a sense, a person's ability to change is really heavily motivated by their motivation. If they don't have the juice within them to move, they're not going to move. Um, so I'm over to your left. Um, so I have a question about, you showed your pie chart earlier, um, and so I'm assuming people can move from like low to moderate to high health involvement, but do you see any uh, tendencies or behaviors that would maybe move somebody who's in a pattern two, they're more likely to go to like a pattern eight or you know, pattern five to like a pattern seven? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yes, it does. Actually, the, of the low involvement people, the YZ frugal is the best one. Of the, there were the three, the critically discerning, health contented, and the YZ frugal. The YZ frugal among that population has the best outcomes, has um, lower rates of disease for that group. So it's easier for a path two person to morph to a path three than it is for a path two to go to a path A. Much different um, level of intensity required for that change. So it's, it'd be easier for, so in a sense, the best option for a path two, the, the more, best, more likely to be successful by going to a path three, trying to switch to that one. And then from there, settle into that for a little while and then move to a path eight, because path three and path eight have more similarities than dissimilarities. Back of the room, back of the room. Yes. Hi. Hi. Do you uh, see specific patterns within cultural groups or socioeconomic groups? Um, has your work kind of touched upon that at all? Yes, there are um, to a degree. Cultural groups, n no. Ethnicity-wise, among blacks, Hispanics, Asians, uh, they're pretty much all the same. I've seen a little bit higher rates of family-centered among Hispanic, the Hispanic population, but. That's, and it's only a minor little one. So not much difference at all um, by ethnicity or race. Um, but the income groups, there are uh, differences. Um, like I say, the YZ frugal group, there's a bigger chunk of them in the lower income stratas. The, 
the three most affluent groups are the, the, the health involved ones, the um, healthcare driven, independently healthy, and the naturalist groups. The independently healthy and the, the um, healthcare driven people are the most likely to have advanced degrees, to have higher rates of, of master's degrees and doctorates. Um, so that is, there is relationships to education as well as to income with the path. But it is possible, like I say, there's a tendency towards higher income groups being in the path, the most active, proactive health path. But it, there can be a, a avoider, I mean the health contented type they can be higher income, just there's not as many of them. Hi there. Oh. Down, more? Fr down front. Okay, um, last one, last just question. Wondering if you surveyed people at all about their involvement or lack of involvement in faith or church or spirituality and what impact or interplay that had? No, haven't explored that haven't? yet. Okay. But that's a goal. Okay, I think, um, thank you very much. I know there's not a big crowd here. <laughs> to the extent that you, that you um, believe what I just told you, then please share it. Because this is something that is gonna get in the way of everybody's efforts to be what they wanna be. Thank you.